Can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, everybody, thumbs up for John. Yes. Okay. Um, we are going to, well, actually, given that he can't hear us well and we can't be recorded on Zoom, this is John Wettmacher. He is a member of the um, Nobel Selection Committee and a professor of high school in the John Studio. That he diligently did you ask for very long periods of time. Um, John is going to give us a bit of a demystification into the Nobel selection process before we hand it over to our second speaker to hear about the science. So I am going to tell him to take it away. Great. Can can you see my slides? I'm sorry. I feel like we're communicating through Morse code. <laughs> can you can you see the slides? Or this line. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, thanks. I hope this works. Um, even after all these years of uh, using Zoom. So Sarah and Carson asked me to say something about the selection process, and I look forward to hearing what uh, Peter's take is on on the science. Uh, for this year's Nobel Prize in Physics, um, which I hope most of you know was awarded um, last Tuesday to uh, Augustini, Krauss, and Lulier for their work on uh, out-of-second pulses, uh, which, Sorry, we'll, <laughs> which you'll hear more about. Um, so <clears throat> um, everything that the Nobel committee does is constrained by the will of Alfred Nobel, who wrote explicitly that the Nobel Prize in Physics should be awarded to an important discovery or invention in the field of physics. He then also left it to uh, be administrated by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in the case of the Chemistry Prize and the Physics Prize. And so what is the selection procedure? I really just want to uh, give you a sober view of what happens in about five minutes because there's so many misconceptions about the prize and, and how it's awarded. So uh, it starts with the administration of the prize through the will of Nobel, and that uh, is um, manifested through the work of the committee. And so the committee for this year is shown here um, on this slide. It uh, consists of members appointed from the physics class of the uh, Swedish Academy of Sciences. And there's core members listed at the top. And then there every year there are co-opted members who uh, either for their expertise or for the specific work that we have to do uh, in the fall, and are asked to join, and they are uh, vo voting members of the committee for the year that they're co-opted. So it starts with nominations. The nominations are uh, essential because if you're going to win a prize in year N, you need to be um, nominated in that same year. The committee sends about 3,000 uh, confidential forms to persons who by statute include the member of the members of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, uh, the members of our committee, former laureates, tenured uh, faculty in the Scandinavian universities, and then two other groups of people who are on a list that uh, varies from, from year to year, but the total is about 3,000 uh, requests for nominations. And after 50 years, pass, you can see who was nominated by who. If you want to see the detailed machinations of the committee, then you have to be able to read Swedish and you have to go to the academy to read that material after your uh, request is made. Okay. So the timeline is this. We just sent out last month this about 3,000 invitations then the, the nominations are due at the end of January next year. The, the bulk of the work that the committee does is really in beginning right after that in February, all the way through August. 
We may consult directly with people who we've consulted before, or there may be uh, specific issues that uh, need technical clarification. We'll contact people and, and talk with them in confidence about these matters. But the real core work of the of the committee is to write a report with recommendations. And that report um, emerges out of the work associated with us contacting the community and interpreting uh, nominations, et cetera. I'll come back to that briefly. Um, the class gets this report. This year was 166 pages. They have um, about three weeks to read it. And then there are two meetings in September where uh, the details are discussed. And then the last Tuesday, uh, there was a, a meeting of, of the um, academy. There's a vote, a majority vote has to um, um, uh, prevail for the uh, nomination to lead to an award. And then right after that, uh, we call uh, the the incipient laureates, and then you then you have the press conference following that immediately, which is uh, where most people see um, what happens. And then on December tenth, there is uh, uh, the ceremony and a big banquet, and that's on the anniversary of Nobel's uh, passing. The real work that we do. Uh, is in writing uh, this these this report, which has multiple chapters. Each chapter has at least two authors, um, and uh, sometimes three, depending on what the topic is. So the thing I really would like to convey to people is that um, there is a continuous, ongoing. Uh, a set of commissions of reports from outside experts. Some areas have been uh, reported on for decades, at least, sometimes longer. And this, this is an essential process that the community plays an enormous role in. So that, that we get in an, a lot of feedback on what how you might interpret some new results in light of past results, and we have a, a very big archive of reports from experts over the years that we are uh, constantly referring to and, and uh, going back to the similar people in, in, in uh, allied areas to really clarify matters at hand. These people are know who they are, but, um, and, and we know who they are, but no one else does. So there's a, a strict uh, level of confidentiality when we uh, ask for feedback from experts. And we really like to get multiple views of a, of a field because, as you know, uh, science is done by people. And there are a lot of different interpretations of results, even if they're um, highly quantitative. There's the question of who did what when, and that takes an enormous amount of time. And then finally, I would like to, uh, it was pointed out in, in the, the abstract for today that there's um, documents that are uh, publicly available on, on the website of the scientific background. If you're interested in the material for any given year, this is a great resource because I can tell you we work very hard to produce this, these resources and they're a distillation of the work that's done in, in making uh, the report. Okay, so I look forward to hearing what Peter has to say, what his take is on the, the work of this year. And who knows, those of you who got a hoodie just now, maybe we'll be uh, learning something about you uh, and your work for the Nobel Prize sometime in the future. All right, thank you very much, John. I'm happy to answer a question if you have any. <laughs> can you actually hear us on Zoom now, at least a bit? I can hear you, Sarah, very well. Okay, all right, excellent. Well, there was thunderous applause and we thank you very much um, for, for the presentation. Okay. So now um, we are going to hear about the science. I'll give Peter a few minutes to plug everything in. I think, I mean, what could go wrong? Um, and what I'll do is just also share this so that people can see 
the speaker, but you know, if you need to move around, you yeah. have to do what you have to do. Okay. So while Peter is setting things up, let me tell you that his timeline to be here today did not start in January. Um, actually, he had about 70 hours to prepare because what we did once the Nobel Prize was announced was locally gather nominations from people, faculty, and say, hey, whose research is similar enough or to the Nobel Prize research so that they are going to be able to tell us about it, right? So thank you. Thank you, Peter, for agreeing to do this on such short notice. Um, Peter is the Associate Professor of Applied Physics and Physics. He's also a very busy person, Director of Graduate Studies. His group focuses on experimental nonlinear optics and spectroscopy. Research areas include the study of natural and artificial forms of optical nonlinearity and nanostructured effective media, the dynamics and evolution of nonlinear systems at new time and length scales, optical forces and energetics in nanoscale systems, and nonlinear nano optomechanical interactions. Um, and with that, I will hand it over. Thanks again. Great. Thank you very much. So let's see. And I don't know how to, is there a way to get a laser pointer? Let's see how. I remember how to, I know laser pointer. I guess that's probably the, there it is, pointer options, a laser pointer. Okay, great. Beautiful. Great. Okay. Can I, can Zoom people hear me? Yeah. We're going to need an Zoom actual Zoom. microphone as well for okay. you, aren't we? I guess I, I can do it from here if that makes sense. Uh, or what, what's best? I can use a laser pointer or, or do it. I think if you're standing around here yeah. and the people in the room will be able to actually maybe hear you if you put that on. Yeah, okay, great. Sure. Can you hear me? Testing, testing. All right, All right thanks. Well, um, yeah, this is, this is a fun new experience um, and, and a pleasure, I think, to share some enthusiasm about some new science that I've just learned <laughs> in learning about the Nobel Prize. Um, we do have things popping up still on Jennifer's. We're going to Sorry. Okay. So, um, so yeah. So, so the uh, as John just mentioned, we have um, a very exciting Nobel Prize this year. I think that's well deserved. Very exciting work. Um, uh, Pierre Agostini, Ferenc Krauss, and Anne uh, Lulia. I had to I had to write that phonetically because I was nervous about trying to pronounce her name. So, so anyway. Um, uh, they've been awarded the Nobel Prize for experimental methods that generate autosecond pulses of light for the study of electron dynamics and matter. Um, and uh, what I'll, what I'll, I'll do my best to give you an introductory uh, overview of um, the techniques for generation of autosecond pulses, which are very much part and parcel. You know, they're, they're utilizing the internal mechanics of an atom in a very, in a fascinating new way in order to produce uh, these autosecond pulses that, that we then use to study atoms and, and molecules in, in more complex systems. So uh, to, to put a little bit of this in perspective, I think it's, it's really helpful to step back and, and take a very you know, high level view of everything. Um, and here, just, just for perspective, you know, why are short pulses useful, powerful? Um, uh, I think for this, it's useful to, to, to have a view of some hierarchy of time scales. Uh, you know, at the human scale, we can perceive ch changes in our environment at the second time scale. Um, but, you know, microseconds, we need a little help. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of my favorite examples of, you know, um, sort of stopping time with pulses is very tactile. You know, these wonderful photos from from Harold Edgerton uh, of using flash photography, microsecond pulses from a lamp, flash lamp, to sort of stop, uh, stop the dynamics that occur when you know that occur when we have a bullet passing through an apple. And it's a really fabulous example. The same idea when we are using ultra-fast lasers, so very short pulses of light that are uh, often femtoseconds in duration. Um, we're using a very similar principle to try to understand dynamics internal to matter. Um, and here is a, 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 a nice sketch by my thesis advisor, Eric Ippen. Um, the idea behind sort of how we would apply stroboscopic imaging to, uh, to understand internal dy dynamics of solids, we might imagine launching a pulse of light that's intense at a solid to change, you know, to elevate it to some excited state. 
um, maybe uh, kicking carriers up from conduction uh, to, from from valence to conduction band. And in the process, we can also drive vibrational excitations in a solid. And and if we if we um, use a sequence of uh, weaker probe pulses, we can actually get a stroboscopic image of the dynamics that ensues uh, after we launch this high energy pulse into the system. Uh, and here you see, for example, oscillations that are characteristic of vibrations in the solid. So, um, so the subject of uh, this femtos, these femtosecond techniques are, you may be aware, uh, were, were the subject of 1999 Nobel Prize. Uh, in chemistry or femtochemistry, using these techniques to study, um, you know, molecules. And uh, um, what's, uh, you know, the subject of this Nobel Prize is autosecond physics, which is really, you know, um, when we're, we're talking about this, we're really talking about decades of amazing technological progress on a number of fronts, as well as deep science, uh, you know, that I'll, I'll try to give you some introduction to. So, um, so one of the things that, that I, I should point out, uh, you know, autosecond physics gives us the opportunity to, to study um, very fast electron dynamics, uh, you know, in, that, that's otherwise been very difficult for us to access. Um, and how do, we, how do we gain some understanding of the time scale of internal dynamics of electrons? Uh, so, so as a starting point, I'm just gonna do very cartoony, simple sketches. So let's imagine we have an atom that's comprised of, say, a positively charged uh, nucleus Coulomb that produces a Coul Coulomb Coulombic potential um, and an electron that's bound to that potential. Um, so, uh, so this is my simple cartoon of our atom with our electron cloud and nucleus. Uh, if we, you know, to understand the time scale of that's, that's you know, relevant to this electron dynamics in a typical atom, we can just think of, uh, you know, a couple of uh, and, you know, uh, quantum states of our electrons, say, you know, this is a crude sketch of, say, a 1s and a 2p orbital, if you like, symmetric and anti-symmetric wave functions. We can uh, consider a superposition of these wave functions with their distinct time oscillating phases. Um, and, and what would happen if we were to sort of play this movie for, for what we get for this, the probability of our matter wave being at any location, we would find that our, our center of mass motion of the electron appears to oscillate around in this potential well. Um, and, uh, and that time period of oscillation is, uh, is very much uh, related to the difference in energies between these two wave functions. We have uh, you know, time oscillating phase that's distinct between these two components of our wave function. And that energy difference delta E divided by Planck's constant is really what tells us uh, the, the period of oscillation or the frequency of oscillation. And, and just to, for a little bit of background, this oscillation, uh, this motion of the electron cloud around the nucleus um, induces a time oscillating dipole moment because you have separation of, of the electron cloud from the nucleus and, and it gives a time oscillating dipole moment. So this, we, we expect, uh, you know, this, this motion in this, in this case, this example that I'm, I'm describing to actually yield radiation from our atom. For example, um, so uh, so just for for perspective, the valence electrons, um, you know, we're typically talking about in a lot of a lot of atoms will have say ele electron volt level uh, energy separations in many cases, giving us time scales of around femtoseconds. And uh, but if we were to consider inner shell electrons, um, we can have you know we can find energy separations. Um, you know, for inner, inner shell electrons that are easily 10 to even 100 electron volts, giving us, um, you know, a very short time scale here. Now we're talking about 60 autoseconds, autoseconds 10 to the minus 18 seconds. So that's, that's a pretty, pretty tough thing to try to, to keep up with if, if you're, you know, we need to have some very advanced techniques to sort of probe things at this time scale. Um, and, and before I get into a little bit of auto, you know, give my high level introduction to uh, the techniques for generation of auto second radiation, I thought it might be useful to begin by giving a little background. I don't know that everybody here is familiar with lasers and, and, and a lot of the stuff that we're talking about in auto second physics builds on prior work in femtosecond, um, you know, laser physics. So I'll just give a very, a whirlwind introduction to a couple of concepts here. Um, the first is just a basic property of a laser. A laser is typically comprised of 
two mirrors, let's say a fully, you know, 100% reflecting mirror and a partially reflecting mirror. We have standing wave modes that are formed within between these reflectors. Um, and if, if we can create a laser by placing a gain medium, so that's, that's a material that has some form of population inversion that can yield amplification of light. And we produce laser oscillation. We can produce laser oscillation for any one of these standing wave modes when the gain, uh, the, the round trip amplification or gain produced by the gain medium matches the round trip loss. And in, in general, in many cases, we find when we create a laser, if the gain medium supports a broad spectral, uh, has a broad gain bandwidth, that often means we can simul this this gain medium can support simultaneous oscillation of many of these um, you know modes, many of these uh, different harmonics uh, of electromagnetic waves that are supported by this resonator. And in in general, when these simultaneously oscillate, um, they they have a rather random irregular phase between them. So the light that would be emitted from this partially reflecting mirror when the system is self oscillating and lasing. Um, is, is, would look like a noisy, continuous wave e emission. Um, but, but over the years, a lot of researchers have developed these amazing techniques to utilize nonlinearity to synchronize these, these different modes within the cavity. Um, typically, we insert something called a satural absorber, but it can actually be any number of nonlinear elements that can produce phase, uh, regular phase coherence between these modes. Uh, and, and if, for example, we use a saturable absorber, it can produce a regular phase relationship such that the, each of these different uh, spectral components yields a Fourier sum that produces pulses, a regular train of pulses whose, uh, whose separation in time matches the separation in frequency uh, of, our, of, our, um, of the modes that are lazy. Okay, so this is the idea behind, you know, that, that auto second physics builds on, uses these lasers that produce very short pulses that can be a few cycles long in infrared wavelengths, giving a few femtoseconds. Um, the other thing that I think for perspective, it's useful just to point out is, um, you know, uh, conventionally, how do nonlinearities allow us to produce new frequencies of light from an, a given input angular frequency? So, so, um, so in that context, it's useful just to to observe that uh, you know there's a there's a nice and very effective approximate cl semi classical model for for an atom that you can you can think of an atom as being you know uh, a, a, you know essentially uh, an electron that is uh, you know bound in, with a harmonic potential to a nucleus um, and if if we think of this harmonic potential as just being parabolic you got Hooke's law you've got you've got a simple harmonic oscillator it's a linear system. And that means that if we if we um, you know excite the system with angular frequency omega, it will respond with that same angular frequency. Um, so this changes, however, if we start to drive our electron um, much harder. So if we if we increase the, the the forcing function, we can actually cause the excursion of the electron to go beyond what we would call a parabolic potential, and this this yields nonlinearity. This form of nonlinearity um, allows us, for example, to take three photons at frequency omega and up convert them to three omega. Okay. And this is what I'm describing here is a rather perturbative approach, meaning we're assuming we're taking small corrections on the response and we are, you know, uh, we're writing it down in some fashion, um, in some series, and then, you know, we, we can understand how the, the atoms uh, electron displacement, which yields uh, in the time varying dipole moment, we can see how that uh, relates to the you know drive and what angular frequencies the electron will oscillate at, uh, such that it can re-radiate not just at angular frequency omega but at new frequencies. Okay, so this is just a little background. If you're walking around labs at Yale, you're and and someone is doing nonlinear optics, they are probably using something like this. All right, so it's something in this perturbative regime. But what auto second physics is doing, it's really throwing that out the window and doing something really amazing. So, um, so in auto second physics, we are now considering what happens to an electron when we take these incredibly short pulses that are just a few optical cycles and amplify them to incredibly high field strength. So now the field strengths are much larger than the ionization, ionization field that's necessary to strip an electron off of an atom. 
Okay. So, so this is my sort of best attempt at a cartoony illustration of what's going on here. So I want you to imagine I have, you know, we're looking at what happens to this, uh, this Coulombic potential that normally holds on to our electron when we are sitting at this this very high field intensity in our in a, in a femtosecond pulse that's been amplified n times. Um, so so the idea is we you know this Coulombic potential uh, suddenly becomes highly distorted such that now we have the opportunity for what was a bound electron to simply tunnel out of of this potential and and be liberated by by and and accelerated at the same time. Uh, so it's now a, 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 an electron that's in the continuum or really freely moving around your around your atom. Um, and what happens as we reach this the trough of our electric field for our pulse is this potential tilts in the opposite direction, pushing the electron back towards towards this um, this Coulombic towards our nucleus. Uh, and and some really dramatic things start to happen when this um, very energetic accelerated electron interacts again with our, uh, you know, our Coulombic potential and the electrons in that potential and the residual wave function in that potential, suddenly we get, you know, emission of some really tremendous, uh, you know, high energy photons. Um, and it's really the picture that I, I have in my head for what's going on here is we're stripping away some part of the wave of the electron wave function through tunneling. It's being accelerated and whipped around and brought back to the atom before this sort of recombination or scattering process occurs, producing really dramatic emission of very short pulses um, at very high energies. So, so over the years, this, um, you know, I think starting in the early 90s, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Anne uh, started studying these har higher harmonic generation processes uh, and, uh, and through both theoretical and experimental studies um, established a really fascinating trend. Um, so it turns out through this higher harmonic generation process, you know, we've liberated the electron from, from the atom, we bring it back such that it scatters off of our, off of our, uh, you know, ionized, um, our ion and, and recombines and scatters uh, to produce these, a ton of higher harmonics. So here what I'm sketching is, um, if you imagine the, the initial frequency of light might be down here, we have a couple of harmonics that are generated with, you know, um, that are below the ionization, uh, you know, energy of our atom. But then when we start to look at spectra that would correspond to energies well above our ionization, we essentially, what, what these researchers, you know, observed and then later predicted through um, semi-classical and then fully quantum descriptions of this process is uh, that there's a relatively flat emission spectrum produced by this process. Uh, you know, giving us a very large number of orders. Um, and, and we can basically summarize what's going to happen here, the basic behavior with this very simple expression. So if, if, H, if omega is the angular frequency of the instant laser field, um, the re-radiated light has a much higher energy that is consistent with adding up a bunch of these, you know, lay, you know um, photon frequencies, H, R, H, H omega L, uh, and combining them to produce a much higher higher photon energy, the um, the maximum uh, order and maximum number of such photons that combine to produce the higher order that I'm sketching over here uh, is an integer times uh, you know this this laser energy laser photon energy, um, which is given by a simple expression. This is the ionization potential of the atom, uh, you know, so it might be ten electron volts or more um, plus this factor of three times what is called the ponder mode of energy, which is just a fancy word for the kinetic energy that our electric field has imparted to this liberated electron that is now uh, careening back towards our nucleus. Okay, so so this uh, so basically what we find is beyond the ionization uh, potential energy, which is uh, you know which which essentially is stops abruptly here. We have this flat plateau of generated tones. Um, before some cutoff frequency. So this is what this expression really tells us. Q max is essentially this cutoff. Okay. So, so this is this really wild process that, that, that's being used to generate incredibly short pulses and with energies that are astoundingly high. Um, so this is, an, this is uh, 
you know, a real spectrum. That was a sketch. Um, this is the real spectrum uh, obtained and, and described in this wonderful review paper by, um, by Ferenc Krauss. Um, and I highly recommend if you're interested in this. Um, so, so you see that we're, we're now, we're taking a photon that was originally at one electron volt and we're now producing incredibly short bursts of light that are uh, as high as 100 electron volts with this process. So really, really wild sort of uh, extreme interactions we're considering here. So the other really fascinating, one of the other things that I, struck me as really fascinating is when this electron moves away from the nucleus and gains a ton of energy, it has a really large momentum as it comes back to interfere with, with the um, with the wave function that still contained in the, you know, bound the nucleus. So, so the process that I would describe is we have this tunneling barrier that we've produced, um, and there's some probability that some fraction of the wave function uh, escapes and accelerates, but there also remains some of the original wave function within, um, bound to the system. So these two, when they recollide, they interfere. And, you know, you might ask, how, how do we understand the dipole moment that's produced here, how do we understand the radiation? I, I thought this is a really lovely picture because when this very, with this wave function with really high kinetic energy interferes with the one that's, uh, the residual wave function that's bound in the potential, um, we have this interference between those two wave function components that actually is what produces this, um, the, 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 wave, the high wave vector and oscillatory period necessary to radiate these harmonics. So this is the basic picture I found really helpful to understand how is it possible you get this incredibly efficient emission and plateau. It's because the dynamics of this atom is totally crazy, totally, totally different from what I'm used to thinking about. Um, and over the years, there's been tremendous progress by this whole community. Um, so there's a lot of researchers doing auto second physics. Um, and, and over the years, we've seen, uh, you know, this is just a plot of shortest pulse generated uh, you know, over the decades. And, and you see that you know, starting around year 2000, we started to get into sort of the auto second regime and all the way down here, we are, I think the shortest one in this plot is 67 auto seconds uh, you know, with, elect with between 55 and 130 electron volts. So that's pretty crazy, uh, at least to me. I hope it's exciting at least to some of you. Um, okay. so. So here I'm, I'm sort of getting to the end of what I can really, really, really understand within, uh, you know, a, a day of, of reading review papers and, 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 and studying various, um, you know, other journal articles. Um, but but I, I'll just give a little bit of a summary of some of the things that uh, that, that, that I thought were really, really fascinating. Uh, so, so one, one, I think, exciting demonstration of how you can use these, this dynamics and, and these pulses is, um, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, a, a group in Italy, um, use this, uh, recombinate, it basically use the electron, uh, accelerated away from the atom and recombining with it sort of as an electron source that they use to do tomography. On the atom. So you guys know if you if you've been through a CT scanner, you you sort of experience tomography, whether you know it or not. Uh, you know if you rotate, uh, you know an object and do and and send X rays through it, you you get a picture, a three dimensional picture. Well, they've done the same thing with the or electron orbitals using these really wild techniques. So uh, of of, an, of of a molecule in this case. Um, the other sort of example is something uh, that the Nobel Committee highlighted in their, in their, you know, their letter sort of ex explaining their justification for the, the really exciting accomplishments that are so tremendous and many by these, uh, by these laureates uh, was, was also the demonstration that, you know, you can do this incredibly high resolution um, electron emission spectroscopy, uh, photo, 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 uh, photoelectron emission spectroscopy um, and, and resolve very subtle differences in the emission times of an electron, photo, photo emitted electron from say water that's in, in vapor form versus aqueous form. And this, uh, you know, delay, there's a slightly longer time it takes for water molecules that are in an aqueous environment with, you know, close, close nearest neighbors that can, in, can affect the, the potential electron seas. Um, 
So uh, they see uh, they, they're able to quantify with this exquisite precision. Uh, you know that, that it takes between 50 and 70 autoseconds longer for the, for an electron to be photoemitted. And this is you know I'd, I'd have to defer to others to help me understand the context for this work, but but uh, but the idea is that this could help elucidate the um, you know the dynamics that these lower these inner shell electrons. Uh, you know what the electron goes through before it can be liberated and escape as a photoelectric, uh, photo emitted, um, uh, uh, you know, photo emission of electron. And this was actually an, an, an his, the um, this was identified as a mystery that first first pinpointed by Einstein in in various forms. Uh, and so this is discussed in the in the um, decision uh, for for, uh, for by by the Nobel Committee. So, so at any rate, uh, that's my best attempt at, at something that's very introductory um, and maybe explains some of the, the fascinating science. I mean, I think it's really tremendous. That they're, you know, using, um, you know, these non-trivial dynamics of, of, um, of atoms and, and ionized atoms and how they interact with this very non-trivial sort of electron um, uh, in interference effect that is produced when stripping an electron away from an atom, recolliding it with with an atom. And I no doubt if you if you take a look, um, you know, and search for auto second physics, you'll find a really huge array of, of really exciting results that are just coming out every day. Um, and 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 this really speaks to the uh, I think the importance of of these really powerful techniques and this tremendous body of work. And persistence that that and and creativity and, and and rigor that these investigators have really brought to this field. So I think it's a very well deserved work. At any rate, uh, that that's that's it. I'm happy to share the slides and some of these reference materials, and hope hope that was useful. And we're going to keep him here. See if there are any questions. Are there questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your question. Um, I'm not sure I totally understood what the physics of this story is. It shows the figure of the uh, uh, actual, like, kind of the. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Can you repeat the question first? Please? Yes. So, the, the question was what exactly did the Nobel laureates do? Uh, and, and I've I think there's a lot of things, and it's kind of hard to summarize. But, but I guess my understanding is that Annie, uh, you know, developed was the first one to really begin studying this higher harmonic generation process and unraveling it, developing, you know, a, a fully quantum description of it that that really elucidated this non-trivial process. Um, and uh, Pierre Augustini and Ferenc Krauss, um, uh, you know, developed. Uh, and and really pushed a lot of the techniques forward and and developed you know infrastructure to implement these really really sophisticated experiments you know there's I can't even begin to explain the the, the amount of timing accuracy and the amount of incredibly exquisite optics and control that you need to do these things is kind of it's, it's really uh, stunning. Um, and, and so there's, there's a huge, there's a myriad of different innovations that were necessary. Ferenc Krauss was, uh, you know, developed techniques to isolate individual autosecond pulses um, and to really get into what was involved there is, is a lot. Uh, but but this, is, this is one of the key accomplishments they highlight for Ferenc. Uh, and then uh, Pierre has developed uh, techniques to make very short uh, sequence of autosecond pulses that are but but not an isolated pulse you can turn on and off to do a really controlled not as controlled an experiment in some ways as what Terence is able to do. So so yeah it's 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 really I think you know a sum of a lot of works and, and really consistent hard work and, and innovation I would say for all of these folks. So it's uh but 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 yeah I mean I'd recommend checking it out on the Nobel webpage. They've got a nice uh you know summary of uh you know about eight, 10 pages walking through the basic accomplishments, they do a pretty good job of putting it in, you know, accessible language. Sounds like they work very hard at it. So we have to all go in. I saw other questions as well. Yeah. Are we really going to modify the corona measure? Yeah, the So the idea, 
behind tunneling and actually maybe this this I don't know if I can zoom on this guy right here. Okay, maybe I can just. So the idea is, you know, your potential uh, when the when an electric field is not applied to the atom just looks nice and symmetric. And um, the if we apply a big DC field uh, at one snapshot in time, that's what the light field is doing, right? It's applying a, a big DC field. And uh, what that does is distort this potential. So we can take this symmetric potential and now add a linear potential to it because um, the electric field, um, you know, the, the potential, the electric potential you, you find for a constant electric field is just say X times electric field is the correct potential. So that ends up putting a, a really big skew on, on the background of your potential. So now an energy, if, if we had an electron that was bound at some energy right here, um, in, in order to make it to an unbound state over here, it really only has a small hump to tunnel over, tunnel through, I should say. Does that make sense? Any other questions? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would guess you can keep going higher and higher. I mean, from, from the theory that I've seen so far and from the con conceptual picture, I would guess I'm not the expert. Okay. This is not my area of research. But, but it, it, from what I can gather, it seems like the more and more you can accelerate those atoms, these electrons in their, you know, unbound state and bring them back, you know, you can keep generating higher and higher harmonics. But I know that there are a lot of subtleties about exactly the frequency that's a frequency of light that's optimal to create those conditions. So, uh, so I got some friends that are doing auto second physics and they were always telling me that it's much more optimal to, to at least for the atomic species that they were working with to, uh, to implement these experiments uh, at, in the mid infrared. So, so that's much more challenging to generate and shift the, get all these, all these amazing capabilities and these really short pulses out in the, you know, longer wavelengths where optics are not as well developed. So that's my, that's what I, one anecdote I know, I can't say for sure, but, but, but it, it, it's possible that it would require, you know, to tune it up and to get the higher and higher harmonics. There might be a lot of other challenges along the way. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just speculating. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, was uh, Lee Gates, I guess, is sort of how it's pronounced Danny's uh, contribution more on the theory side? No, she she was the first one to do experiments that were investigating higher harmonic generation and sort of recognizing that this this process can yield this peculiar array of uh, you know higher order uh, higher harmonics. And, and also, I think she, I don't know her background very well. I don't know, it, she's on a number of theory papers uh, and is, is a leading author on them, but I don't know, you know, to what extent the theory stayed in her group versus being a, a big collaborative effort. So I, I didn't look into that. So like a little over a decade ago, I met this guy, Paul Porco. Yeah, yeah. Who's supposed to get some of this Nobel Prize? Yeah, yeah. And now maybe John can explain why he didn't. Uh, can repeat it, see if John wants to. Oh, yeah, so. He's not going to know. Oh, yeah, I'm sure John can't yeah, say but He's always been disappointed, not always. Yes. Just hurts. Well, and, and that's the thing I would just, you know, I, I, I've, this, over the years, you know, I think, in, in 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 a lot of ways, we have to acknowledge that that there are a huge number of people in this field who made crucial innovations that everyone is using, and that this this is all building upon. And and I I, I get, I'm guessing that the Nobel Committee is is really just choosing the apps, you know these these folks who really really you know put the pedal to the metal for years and years and years, keep pushing us to the edge. Uh, you know, it is it is it is really the honor of a whole community. Frankly, I think I think it's really, you know, it's really just a way to elevate this, you know, to get the recognition and excitement around some innovative and exciting science. And it really is a, a an award I would say for the whole community. I mean, you kind of have to view it that way. 
but um, but I don't know. Some people really want the glory. I know that. <laughs> and I mean, you know, these investigators, these laureates are very deserving. I think their work is really tremendous. So um, just, you know, how do you how do you acknowledge the work of everyone? It's, it's tricky. More sociological or scientific? Yeah. Um, what kind of patterns are used to um, doing social Neon, uh, I'm trying to remember what the, uh, I know Neon, I, I'm not sure, I'd have to look back, that's a good question. Um, but it's definitely, in Ferenc Krauss has a beautiful, very accessible, um, about a hundred page review paper. <laughs> so so it's it, it's very dense and very good. So I, I'm sure you'd find a lot of a lot of them there uh, that answers your questions there. For example, if the virus became a battle, if we go down further. Uh, I don't know that there is a fundamental limit, uh, you know, thinker. I, I, yeah, I'm not, I mean, I guess it's a question of, you mean like, can, can, if you're, are you thinking, are you asking the question, if we can wiggle an electron fast enough, can the, can our quantized fields or can our field representation handle it? The answer is yes. But I don't, you know, I think the cha second challenge is wiggling your electrons that fast. So I don't, I don't know uh, if there, you know, what what the fundamental limits might be. I'm, I'm guessing there may be some, but I I, I don't know offhand. Um, but it pro probably it's possible that some of the practical challenges might be getting all of the different spectral components of the light that you've generated not to spread out. So that is one of the things. So so that's. Um, uh, that's one of the challenges of making a very short pulse is to, uh, to, to make sure all the Fourier components stay phased up exactly where you want them to do your experiments. And that's a, that's a tricky thing to do tactically, to, to make sure that, that um, your pulse doesn't broaden as it propagates. Um, I, I mean, I don't see, I, I, from what I've learned in, in you know, my one day of expertise or one and a half days, I, I don't see a fundamental limit. I'd have to defer to someone else if you really want to, you know, investigate that further. I mean, you can certainly email the laureates and ask. I'm sure they enjoy it. But the dense of plasma you can get, right? The starting point of a charged cloud is density. Well, the, the way that uh, this, my understanding is it's all about the kinetic energy that the electron re, you know, the re-colliding electron wave function has, that's re what gives you your upper limit. Um, and that's, yeah. Uh, so, so we're not, I'm, I'm, I'm still getting used to not thinking about the electron and the bound potential. That's, I've lived in a bound potential my whole life. So, you know. All right, to breaking free. Let's thank Peter again very much. It's nice to have some explanation for the science and hopefully people are now motivated to go and read the results of the, the Nobel Committee and, and the 100 page extremely accessible paper that <laughs> maybe we'll discuss next week. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Welcome to the, the new physics majors. And this was a nice reminder today of the really collaborative nature of science. We're celebrating a prize to a few people, but the reality is that um, many, many people contribute and many, many of us are gonna benefit. All right, happy rest of the semester. Thanks for coming everyone. And goodbye on Zoom. Thank you. Stop the recording. <laughs>